evening, Reach. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited that you're here and you're watching from wherever you're at. This is going to be a fun night, hopefully. We're going to continue on. I hope y'all had a great Easter. I know it wasn't the same as what we're used to. I know we had to be at home and not together, but hopefully you got to tune into the live stream and hopefully you had a wonderful Easter and got to celebrate. So tonight we're going to continue forward and we're just praying for this quarantine to lift, hopefully sooner than later. But in the meantime, we're going to still continue doing these videos and, and meeting on Tuesday nights at 630 even though we're not together, we can at least have some fun and, and, and play a game or two and, and, and share a message. So, uh, tonight our game is Pictionary. Uh, they weren't, Zane and Stephen weren't very good actors last week. Um, they tried really hard though, so maybe they're better drawers. I don't know, we'll find out, we'll see. You're shaking your head like, no, we're not very good at drawing. Um, but, but here we go. So, first to put in the chat box what these... Uh, contestants, we'll call them. Our drawing is is the winner gets a point, and we'll have about ten rounds or so. And the theme for this Pictionary, all of the rounds, is going to be um, scarce, hard to find things during this quarantine. Scarce and hard to find things, or interactions, or whatever you want to call it during this quarantine. All right. So our first, who's going first? Me. All right, Stephen is up. I abbreviated that. You got it? Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to give you around, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 seconds, just, just depending on how good of a drawer you are. And Zane, you can step away so they can see. Remember, Stephen? Yep, there you go. A bad picture that's pretty good it's hand sanitizer hand sanitizer very hard to find i don't think you can find it since probably the first i don't know week of this quarantine of sorts all right zane you are up this one is really really easy it's, it's super easy all right so stand to the side so everybody can see you can go look at your screen up so you can see what you're doing. All right, ready, set, go! <laughs> So the answer is toilet paper. It's something everybody needs, and it's something that nobody can find. So uh, hopefully you've got some toilet paper at home. If not, I don't know. That's tough luck, right? Use your hand. Oh, that's gross. Nope, that's wrong. That's wrong. All right. This is another essential item. That is very hard to find. Try to stand to the side so people can see your drawing, Steven. On your marks, get set, go! <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha 
was a mask. Good job, Stephen. A mask. All right, Zane, you're up. This is another essential item that's been very difficult to find. All right, you ready? Stand to the side so everybody can see. Get ready to enter in the chat box. Marks, get set, go! <laughs> So uh, if you're a master guesser or you just got lucky, it was bread. I'm assuming this is this is bread <laughs> and uh, wheat. All right. Good try. Maybe somebody got it. Good try. It's a good try. So far, Steven's done better. This one's easy, though. Did you get it? All right. Here we go. <laughs> So it was gloves, gloves, hard to find pretty much anywhere. All right, Zane. <laughs> you got something else you can't draw. <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> All right, three, two, one, go. <laughs> This is it. This is everybody. Obviously, this is uh, paper towels. Paper towels. How do you draw paper towels? Paper towels. Good try, Zane. It's, it's good try. That's all I got. That's all I got for you. This one's gonna be a little difficult, but this is also another item or items that are hard to find. So three, two, one, go. <laughs> Chicken leg, right? Turkey leg, something like that. Close Steak. enough. Steak. Oh, yeah. Steak. <laughs> so I carry my steak around with with my hand like that. Take chunks off. Hey, got to do what you got to do in the in the quarantine. 
You said you could earlier. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Go for it. your answers in it is a haircut because you know you can't get haircuts sad day all right this is a little difficult but another thing that's hard to find <laughs> Lysol wipes. Lysol wipes. That's not bad. All right, so we're in the bonus round. All right, so this one isn't exactly a item. This is a, well, it's just not exactly an item. But it's another thing that we can't do during the quarantine. This is probably going to be one of the more tough ones. So y'all can uh, teamwork on this if you want. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, yep. So what it was was social distancing. Social distancing, something that um, you know, is something, huh? Social interaction, actually. Social interaction, social distancing. Either way, whatever. We haven't had a lot of that. We haven't had a lot of social interaction. We've had a whole lot of social distancing. So that was that was uh, the game. Hopefully, you got some of them. Uh, if not, they're not great drawlers, but they tried. So we're going to be starting a message here in just a few. Thank you for playing and stay tuned.
Good evening, Reach. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for tuning in as always. I really truly am missing you guys more and more every week and not being able to meet together on Tuesday nights, but I am glad we continue we can continue to do this, continue to try to facilitate some conversation and some some uh, family and, and, and some fellowship or whatever you want to call it. And so I'm just glad that you're here and you've joined us. So Happy Easter. I hope you had a, a great Sunday, Easter Sunday, and got to celebrate. I hope you uh, had some fun. I know it was probably different for most of you. I was thinking about my own life. It was probably the first Sunday or Easter Sunday in my entire life that I wasn't at church with, with my church family on Easter Sunday. So that was totally different, but I hope you got to celebrate in some way, shape, or form and to, to celebrate Christ in all of this. So again, we're going to continue to do this. We're going to continue to do our virtual reach every Tuesday night at 6.30. So pass the word along. If you have some friends who are, are kind of feeling disconnected, hopefully they can get connected in and uh, we can continue to do this. So last week we talked about Easter. We talked about uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross and, 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 and basically moving forward from that and how he, he died and he rose again and, and moving into this week and the next couple of weeks, I want to start a new series called Who is Jesus? I got to thinking about the message last week, and we talked about what if Jesus isn't who he says he is. And, and Paul talked about that, how our faith would be useless. And so I want to kind of continue on in that, that, that same theme and really talk about who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in your life, and hopefully um, it'll just become even more of a reality of who Jesus is and who he wants to be in your life moving forward. So this, this week is all about forgiveness, and I think that's something that we all deal with, we all need, and we all have sometimes other people who need to be forgiven, and maybe we struggle with that. So um, we all have stories about forgiveness because, honestly, we all mess up, we all screw up, and we all need forgiveness. So uh, sometimes there's some, some funny stories that come along with that, most of the time not. A lot of times it's really messy and it's really painful and hurtful when we have to ask for forgiveness or someone has to ask us for forgiveness. Uh, but there was a, a couple stories in my life, but I want to share one from my college days and I want to share one from my, my roommate because it was pretty funny and uh, I'll set the scene for you. So it was my freshman year in college, and I lived in a dorm, which was, I think, 11 floors, and it was just crammed full of, basically, freshman college students. So it's a disaster. It's a nightmare. It's really tight living quarters. And on my hallway, there were six rooms, and each room had two guys in, in the room. So there's 12 of us, and we all shared one hall bathroom, which honestly was the most disgusting bathroom that I've ever had in my entire life. You can imagine 12 college guys sharing a bathroom is bad, is, is, is really bad. There's tons of stories just around that in general that I'll spare you of. Um, but, but one night we were staying up late. We didn't have class the next day. And uh, we ate a lot of Chinese food and ramen noodles because, you know, budget friendly. And we, <clears throat> my, my roommate comes out of the room, and we're in the hall for whatever reason. He comes out of his room, and uh, he has a chopstick. And I was, chopstick is on fire, and he's, he's holding it up, and he's just laughing about it, and the thing's just, just on fire. It's kind of like a candle, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I thought it was funny, so don't do that. Don't, don't light a chopstick on fire in your college dorm uh, or anywhere in general, but, but as soon as, as he got halfway down the hall, the security guard who monitors the hall late at night to make sure that everybody's not doing anything stupid and to make sure everybody's safe they kind of just roam the halls every few hours in the middle of the night. And so it's like one or two in the morning. She, she comes through that door, and all she sees is, is my buddy holding a chopstick that's on fire. And she lit into him, pardon the pun, but she lit into him and was like, what are you doing? Are you trying to burn this building down, and I'm going to turn you in for arson? And she had him going. I mean, he was basically in tears begging her for forgiveness to not turn him in. And I think she was just doing it because she was bored and, and she needed some, some fun and some entertainment from some college guys. And, and so eventually she, she led him off and she said, just don't do it again. And I just remember my buddy begging for forgiveness and just like, please don't turn me in. And please, I don't want to be kicked out of my dorm room. I don't want to be kicked out of college. And, and, uh, 
it was, it was a disaster, but it was pretty funny for me as I, as I was an onlooker and kind of was laughing at him. A little nervous at first for him, but it all, it all worked out. So I want to take a, a pause for a minute, have some fun. Give me one of your own stories where you needed to ask for forgiveness, and it was kind of comical after it was all said and done. So give me a story from yourself. You can go ahead and put it in the chat box, and I'll give you uh, a minute or two to respond. All right, so I hope at this point you've had a minute or two to respond and, and share some of your uh, silly things that you may have done that you needed to ask for forgiveness. But here's the deal. Like 99% of the time, forgiveness isn't easy. And a lot of times the circumstances around asking for forgiveness or someone asking you to forgive them is really messy, messy really hurtful, really painful, and not really funny. So question number two for tonight is this. Is it easier for you to forgive someone or to ask someone for forgiveness? Is it easier to forgive someone or to ask someone for forgiveness? So I'll give you another minute or two to respond in the, uh, in the chat, chat box. All right, so now that we've chatted about forgiveness for a little bit, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Last question for this segment of the message is this. What do you think forgiveness means? In your own words, what does forgiveness mean? Define it. So go ahead in your chat box, submit in what you think forgiveness means uh, for your own life and what you've kind of learned from, from, from your experiences. All right, so I looked up the definition. If you want to get really, uh, uh, if you want to get down to what it really means from a dictionary standpoint, point, it's, it's to stop feeling resentful or angry against someone for an offense, flaw, 
or mistake. To stop feeling resentful or angry against someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. So, obviously, we all have our own definitions probably of what forgiveness means to us, but it's probably something about apologizing and and someone forgiving you for a mistake you've made. So, they're basically saying, I'm dropping the anger, I'm dropping the resentment, uh, I'm I'm not offended anymore, Let's, let's make some peace, and let's move on. And asking for forgiveness is never easy. But it's always such a relief when you know that forgiveness has been given to you. There's, there's not a lot worse in this world than knowing you've done some wrong, feeling really guilty about it, and not, sh- not being sure if the person's going to forgive you. And maybe it takes months or maybe even takes years, and that whole time it's kind of in the back of your mind. Are they going to forgive me? I just wish they would forgive me. And it's not, it's not a pretty or an easy thing a lot of times. But here's the thing about forgiveness. When you, when you mess up, the only person who can forgive you is the person you hurt, right? So when you make a mistake, you know, you talk behind your friend's back or you gossip about them and they find out and, and you feel bad about it, the only person that can forgive you is that person that you gossip about. Not their friends, not your parents. The only person that can forgive you is the person that you hurt. You, you, you can't forgive me for, for something I did to someone else. Only they have the power to forgive me. So fortunately, sometimes people are really quick to forgive, but also unfortunately, sometimes people aren't quick to forgive. And I'm sure that you've had both scenarios in your life. You've had people who were really quick to forgive you, and then you've had some people who held that grudge for, for, for maybe months, maybe even years, and maybe they're still even holding a grudge against you for something you've done. And so you have that lingering in the back of your mind. So we're talking all about forgiveness. So why does it matter to God and why does it matter to us? And at the end of the day, this whole series for the next couple of weeks is, is who is Jesus? And we've all had experiences with forgiveness. And, and, and maybe you, when you think about forgiveness, you, you think about this pivotal time when you were forgiven or when someone uh, hurt you and you were able to step up and forgive them. Or maybe you, you chose not to forgive someone and so you're still hanging on to that. You're struggling to forgive or to ask someone for forgiveness. But forgiveness is something that we often need to give as well as receive. And today I want to learn from someone who knows a whole lot about forgiveness. And obviously with the title, Who is Jesus? The person we're going to talk about is is Jesus. Because there's no one in this world, in heaven, there's no one who knows more about forgiveness and really gave us the way to forgiveness than, than Jesus. And so whether you've been in church your whole life, or this is your, your first time kind of tuning in to, to church, we all have an idea of, of who Jesus is. Maybe some of us think Jesus is a, a nice guy. Maybe some of us think Jesus was this, this teacher that, that, that we read about in history. Maybe some of us have Jesus as like a, a carpenter, someone who makes things out of wood. Maybe we think of Jesus as this guy who walks on water. Whatever you think about Jesus, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, you'll learn something. And, and you'll learn more about who he really is and who he wants to be in your life. And so, who is Jesus? And that's the question that I want you to think about here for the next minute or two. In just one word, or maybe two, I'll give you two if you struggle to come up with, with one word. One or two words, come up with who do you think Jesus is? Who is Jesus? So I'll go ahead and give you a minute or two to respond in the, the comment box. Who is Jesus? Go for it.
right, question number two for this segment is, who do other people say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you is number one. And then so this one is, who do other people? So like, who do your school friends say Jesus is? Or who do your uh, people you hang out with on a regular basis say Jesus is? Or who does the world say Jesus is? So who do other people say Jesus is? Go ahead and respond. So I hope you've had a minute to respond about who Jesus is to you, who Jesus is to the world or to other people. So here's the deal. People have always had questions about who Jesus is. They always have and they probably always will. And when Jesus was still walking this earth, he knew that there was a lot of people who had questions about who he, who he was. And so one day, Jesus decided to ask his disciples, the people that he was kind of living life with and teaching, and they were learning and growing and going out together into ministry. So he, he asked this close group of, of, of men, who do, you, who, do you, who, do, who do people say I am? And who do you say I am? So let's, let's take a look at that in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16. We can... We can read this together. It says this. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asked them, But who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So these disciples came up with a whole list of, of what other people say that Jesus, who, or who Jesus is. And they came up with, with a, a, bunch of, a bunch of names of people. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. So in other words, people thought Jesus was this good teacher or this religious leader of sorts. This good teacher or religious leader. And if you're not sure what a prophet is, they're just simply a person who speaks to God and for God. So God will, you know, call them out of, 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 of a group of people and say, hey, I need you to go and send this message to this given group of people. So they're, they're talking with God and then they go speak for God to this, this group of people. And sometimes it worked out well and sometimes it didn't work out well. Uh, but that's what a prophet is. And so in a sense, these people were right about Jesus. Jesus was a person who spoke to God and for God. So in one sense, yes, they, they were sort of right, but they also weren't exactly right either because Jesus just isn't another prophet who speaks to and for God. Jesus is God, and there's a, there's a big difference. After his disciples answered his question, Jesus asked another question, and this time, he didn't want to know what everybody else thought about him. He wanted to know what his closest followers thought about him, his closest friends thought about him. Who did, who did they think he was? And Peter speaks up, and Peter said he believed two things about Jesus. And this is really powerful because I think Peter is one of the first to realize truly who, who Jesus is and who Jesus was in his life. There's two things that he said. He said, you're the Messiah. And Messiah is just simply a word used to talk about someone who would save God's people. It's about a person who would save God's people. And we'll talk more about the Messiah and what that means next week. But the second thing he said is that you're the son of the living God. You're the son of the living God. And that's a pretty big statement. If someone told you they believed you had come to save the world because you are the daughter or the son of an all-powerful deity, the one who created the universe, you would think you were either on some YouTube prank show or that they had completely lost their mind, right? Like, that's crazy talk. 
But, but here's the deal. In Jesus's case, it was true. And people were starting to see that, and maybe even some of them were starting to believe it. But I know that it can be hard to believe and understand or even defend the statement that Jesus is God. That's a, a, a hard thing to wrap our minds around. And so today I want to share a story that I think helps us to answer the question, is Jesus really God? And as we read this story, I want you to visualize what it would be like if this story happened to you right now. Like right where you're at in your house, this scenario was, was happening. So put yourself in this position. And I want you to remember that this isn't just some fairy tale or some story that, that this fictional story that, that someone kind of wrote and created. This is real life accounts. Like this is historical accounts of people just like me and you seeing something happen, being there at the set, and then recording it, handwriting it, and passing it along. These are historical documents. So as we read this, visualize that you're in this scene. So this is Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several, day, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. And soon, it, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. And so they, they dug a hole through the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law were sitting there and thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, and so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? And so I will prove to you that the Son of Man is a title, Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked out through the stunned onlookers, and they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. So this is a pretty amazing story, right? There's a whole lot going on here. There's a whole lot of excitement. Um, it's pretty crazy when you start to think about it. Jesus was, was returning from pre preaching his tour in Galilee, and at this point, he was basically like a celebrity, like people flocked to Jesus to see him. And so this house that he was in, this room was completely packed out, even all the way to the front door. And in and, and my imagination, it seems like to me that there's just crowds around the house and probably people trying to look in through, through the window. And, and it's just like there are a lot of people surrounding this house trying to get in to see Jesus. And the house is only so big. It is, it is packed out. And at this point in Jesus' ministry, he'd already healed a ton of people from sickness and paralysis and blindness and even death. So he had done some amazing miracles, and he had this reputation as a miracle worker. And having heard about Jesus, this paralyzed man wanted to see Jesus in hopes that he too might be healed. Now, this makes sense because, I mean, we, we have various scenarios in our day and age where where we have this new great product that's going to change your life and people flock to it and buy it and support it because they think it's going to change their life. Well, you've got this man, Jesus, who is literally healing people. Obviously, people would flock to him. Obviously, this paralyzed man would want to see him in hopes that maybe Jesus could do a miracle on him. And in an act of total desperation or courage or maybe even stupidity, I don't know, but this guy and his friends decide to try something to, to probably everybody else that seems a little reckless. Like they couldn't get in to see Jesus through the front door, but they thought, hmm, maybe, maybe just maybe we could go through the roof. Now, I stop here in this story because I, and laugh a little bit because this is something that I would do. Like, this is something me and my buddies would do. Like, hey, we can't get in through the door. Let's climb on the roof, right? Because, I mean, that's, that's a smart idea. And, and uh, not to mention, this isn't the dude's house. Like, this isn't, this isn't his house. So he's climbing on a stranger's roof to, to try to get to see Jesus because he can't get through the front door. A lot of, a lot of funny things going on here. And so while Jesus is teaching, you know, they climb on the roof. 
and they start to like dig and tear a hole in this roof so that they can lower their friend down towards Jesus. And I'm maybe, I don't know, but the only thing I can think of is like Mission Impossible. Do, 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 like the man being lowered on the mat, like tearing, tearing a hole through the roof and Jesus sitting there and it's just like dust is falling out from the roof. And, you know, the owner's like, hey, I told you to fix the roof. You never fixed it. And it's just like all of a sudden, you know, this, this man on a mat is being lowered down in front of Jesus. Pretty crazy, funny, cool. I don't know what you call it, but it's, it's bold. It's bold for sure. And so they, they lower their friend down right in front of Jesus. And I'm guessing, this is, this is just my mind at work here. I'm guessing this man is very excited to finally see Jesus. And he's probably thinking like, finally, finally, I'm going to be healed. I've been paralyzed, and finally, I'm going to be healed. And then Jesus says to him, I forgive you. I forgive you. And we don't see the response in the scripture of this man. We don't know how he responded. But my mind gets to thinking, if I were this paralyzed man, then how would I, how would I respond? And honestly, when Jesus said, I forgive you, I'd be like, uh, that's great. Thanks, Jesus. But, but like, that's not, that's not why I'm here. I, I, I want to walk again. I want to I wanna be healed from, from my paralysis. Like, I want to I wanna see this miracle. I, I'm glad you forgive me. I'm a little confused about it, but, but, but I want to I wanna walk again. And it makes us beg the question, why did, why did Jesus offer this man forgiveness? Like, why would you, of all people, this paralyzed man who just, you know, his friends carried him up onto a roof, lowered him down through it, why, of all people, would he... Would he say, I forgive you? Had this man done something wrong to offend Jesus? Was it the whole dropping in through the roof thing? What was it? What I think Jesus was doing was, was much bigger than what anybody realized. See, a few minutes ago, I said that when you hurt somebody, the only person who can forgive you is the person that you harmed. And by offering forgiveness to this man... Jesus is letting us know that this man had done something to harm Jesus. But what? What did this man do to Jesus? And I think to understand that, you've got to understand the grand picture of what's going on. Because here's the deal. God created everything. He created you. He created me, the world, and everyone in it. And any time we harm ourselves or others or the world we live in, we are harming God who created them. All sin is really a sin against God. So that time you cheated on the test, or that time you punched your brother in the face because he made you angry, or that time you talked back to your parents, or that time that you, you know, snuck out of the house or stayed out too late, or that time that you gossiped behind your friend's back, or you you, um, did something that you knew you shouldn't, all of those times, those were sins against God. And that's, that's pretty bad news, right? But here's the good news. Because every sin is a sin against God, God has the authority to forgive every sin. And so when Jesus tells this man his sins are forgiven, he's making a really big statement. He's saying, I'm not just a good teacher, you guys. I'm not just this prophet that... that that, that you've seen before. My authority comes from God because I am God. And then to prove his point, Jesus told the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Not only healing him spiritually, but physically too. Pretty cool stuff. An amazing point that Jesus is making that made the Pharisees, the religious teachers, just irate for this man to call himself God. But Jesus is who he says he is. And so maybe you're thinking, okay, fine, maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus is God. But what does that mean for me, and why does it matter? And to help us figure out this, I want to try something a little different. I want to um, give you a chance to finish this sentence. So finish the sentence, if Jesus isn't God, then 
dot, 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 fill in the blank. If Jesus isn't God, then what? So I'll give you an example. If Jesus isn't God, then I don't need to go to church. So if Jesus isn't God, what we're doing right now and you tuning in is absolutely pointless. You're wasting your time if Jesus isn't God. So you get the point. Go ahead, fill in that blank, give you a minute or two to do that. All right, so hopefully at this point you've responded. There's a million different scenarios that could happen if Jesus isn't God. If Jesus isn't God, then my sins aren't forgiven. If Jesus isn't God, then what would faith look like or even be? If Jesus isn't God, then what would our lives be like? And on and on and on and on. Now, obviously things would be a whole lot different if Jesus weren't God. So now I want you to think about what it means that Jesus is God. So fill in this blank. If Jesus is God... What does that mean for you? If Jesus is God, what does that mean for fill in the blank? Go for it.
All right, so thanks for your answers. Uh, again, if Jesus is God, it means astronomical things in your life uh, and, and in our world. So as we finish up for tonight, I have one more question for you to answer, but this time I don't necessarily want you to submit your answers. I want you to think about this answer as you move into the evening, and, and, and hopefully before you go to bed, you'll have some sort of answer for this question. Um, this is the one to hang on to, because let's assume for a minute that Jesus is God like he claimed to be. And we've talked about what we can or should do differently if Jesus is God, but, but here's my question. If Jesus is God, then what will you do about it? Let's make this personal. Because if Jesus is God, what will you do about it? Not your friend, not your parents, not your dog or your cat, or whoever you're locked in your house with, but you. If Jesus is God, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to live your life like he is alive? Because that's who Jesus is. The Son of God, the one who gave his life, the one who defeated death, the one who is alive. If Jesus is God, I will fill in the blank. Because here's the thing. If Jesus is God, then it should change everything about our lives, about our faith. And maybe knowing Jesus is God has already changed your life, or maybe you're not sure yet. You're, you're kind of trying to figure this whole Jesus thing out. But no matter where you are in your faith, I hope this week you hear and consider how this one claim can or already has changed your whole life, if it's true. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So who do you say Jesus is? And if he claims, if he is who he claims to be, then how could it change your life forever? What are you going to do if Jesus is who he says he is? I hope you have an answer I hope you live it out because I believe that Jesus is who he says he is and it has changed my life forever. And I'm going to do everything I can to make a difference in this world for him. And I hope you choose to do the same. Some of you are already doing it in amazing ways. Let's continue to push this message forward. And if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you want to know more about Jesus, please ask. Reach out to us. Just, just click that live prayer button. Reach out to us. Shoot us a text. It doesn't matter. But just ask those questions because Jesus is who he says he is. And he wants to be an integral part of your life. He can change your life forever. So as we close out tonight, just remember that question. If Jesus is who he says he is, what are you going to do about it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. Even though we're not together physically, we're together in this, in this online world we live in. And Father, it's, it's pretty amazing to be able to keep up conversation and to pray with, with each other, even though we're not together, and to be able to chat and to talk about you and talk about pushing the gospel forward. And I pray that we can do that. I pray that we don't let this, this, this uh, isolations of sorts, the social distancing stop us from pushing the gospel message forward. And at the end of the day, I love the fact that you are who you say you are. And you proved it over and over again throughout Scripture, and you've proved it over and over again in our lives that you are who you say you are. You're the Son of God. And I pray tonight that if there's someone listening who doesn't have a relationship with you, that they'll give you a chance. They'll understand that, hey, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, but Jesus gave his life, rose again, so that, that sin could be defeated. And so I could be made whole, and I could be given everlasting life and purpose and hope and an ability to make a difference in this world. And so, Father, we just give you all the praise and glory. I pray that we can all ask that question. What are we going to do? If you are who you say you are, then what am I going to do about it today and tomorrow and next week and this year and on and on and on? Because I truly believe you are who you say you are. And I hope that I can do my best. I hope we can do our best as, as your people to take that message out into the world. So we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.